This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural lesson today comes from Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 through 9, reading from the New Living Translation of the Scriptures. Notice there these words. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the heaven, the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs, King James Version says, a mist came up from the ground and watered all the land. And then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. And then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I'm speaking today simply from the subject, plant it for purpose. Plant it for purpose. It is interesting to note here that God planted the first garden. The Bible says God planted the garden. He created the earth, but he planted the garden. And then he planted a man in the garden because God always creates the place and then he sends the person to, to the place. Uh, he, the reason that we, we are oftentimes called the seed of Abraham, seed is totally insignificant if it has no place to be planted. So that's why God said to Abraham, Abraham, get up and go into a place, a land that I will show you. Because he was the carrier of the seed, but he had no land. And God says, I'm going to take you to a place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also, God always creates the place and then he, he'll back up and create the person for the place. He formed the woman's womb before he put the baby in the womb. He got the place, the birthing transformation chamber ready first. Then the seed goes there. There's no reason for a seed to go to a place where there's not an incubation chamber that is waiting. And the earth, the soil is the incubator for seed. And so seed means nothing until it gets to the place. And that's why sometimes you can carry purpose, you can carry destiny on the inside of you. And it is not until you get in proximity of the place that now what you carry begins to make sense. It is amazing that when Mary and Elizabeth came in proximity with each other, they were both carrying something, but until they, they got close to it, it made the baby leap in her womb. So something leapt in Elizabeth that she had been carrying for at least six months and had never felt her baby move. But the moment that it came into cataclysmic encounter with its, the one that it would become the forerunner of, something leapt in her womb. You got to be able to get people around you that make your baby leap. Somebody that has something, that's when you realize I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place. If God called you to this ministry, there ought to be things that are said here that causes something to leap in your spirit. That makes your baby come alive and you realize, hey, hey God, I, I, realize, I hear you talking to me. This is not a coincidence. I hear you, Lord God. I hear you and this is not an accident, but I hear you. And so that's how you know oftentimes that you are connected in kingdom purpose with someone is that they, they will stir something in your heart. They'll stir something in your heart. God planted the garden and then he planted the man in the garden. 
He planted the garden and then he planted the man in the garden because God has us there for purpose. He planted a garden and he put Adam there on purpose and then gave him a purpose. Well, what purpose did he give him? It's right in the same chapter, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to do what? To tend and watch over it. So he had to tend it. God is not going to just give you everything already done. He'll give you something to cultivate. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he gave you your children and they were already up walking and potty trained and everything? God said, hey, I'm giving you a seed, tend it. Tend it. Because some wild stuff is going to start growing up around them and, and, and in them, and you got to pluck it out while they're young, while you can still get it out with a switch. <laughs> Where, where you begin to actually lay down some laws and create some barriers and say, uh, 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 not, not here, not here, not here. So God gave him a job, told him, cultivate this. Nothing is more important than the garden of your mind or your soul where seeds called thoughts are planted. And every time that a thought or an idea comes into your mind, that thought will have a consequence if you allow it to begin to take root in the garden of your mind, it will eventually bear fruit. And this is why the scriptures has taught us the principles, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it come the issues of your life. Somehow, somebody planted something, and if you're not careful, something will grow that does not look like the seed that you put into the ground. Because the Bible says when you plant the seed, it comes up of its own. Did you ever notice that nobody ever plants weed seeds? Weeds grow up on their own. The Bible says an enemy hath done this while men slept. They sowed weeds, tares, weeds. And the weeds begin to choke out the life of it. May I say this to you? One of the ways... To be able to control the weeds is to grow thick grass. If you have thick vegetation there, it'll choke out the life of the weeds. And so sometimes you don't need to be weed conscious. You need to be think about, thinking about growing your grass. If you grow your grass strongly enough, when you've got grass that's like a strong carpet, that is out there, the weeds don't grow there because the strength of the grass itself chokes out the life of the weed. And so fortify your grass, water your grass, protect your grass, fertilize your grass because it is the best weed deterrent. So I don't wanna walk around all the time with the devil on my mind. I'm not here to serve him. I want God on my mind. I want to sow my mind with things of the Word of God. I want to build on things that are eternal. I don't want to be thinking about you, devil. I'm not here for you. In fact, you ought to look at the devil sometimes and say, devil, I ain't thinking about you. When God is on your mind, when God is on your mind, I'm telling you, when God is on your mind and the seeds of his Word are planted in the garden of your mind, you will reproduce a harvest of things that will produce life and peace. That's the fruit of how you know that you've, you've given birth to something that really comes from God. And I love the fact that God not only planted the garden, but he planted the man in the garden and gave him an assignment. But notice what the Bible says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18. But now God has set members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. God planted the members in the body of Christ as it has pleased him. He planted the members in our natural bodies as it has pleased him according to his purpose to suit his purpose for which he created it. And God says, I'm pleased with this, the way that I have set the members. Now listen, when God sets you, you don't leave because you get upset. Because you will always find something that's going to be upsetting even when God has sent a person in your life, you're going to see some things that are upsetting to you about that person. You can't leave every time you get upset. You'll be hopping from house to house. 
because of what she said or what she didn't say. Or because of what he said or what he did. You'll be hopping from relationship to relationship just like that. You know, you don't leave when God has set you just because you get upset. You have to say, Lord, whatever it is that you need to do in me, whatever that needs to die in me so that I can live in peace here. Because dead folks don't complain. And dead folks don't stress and dead folks don't worry. Sometimes God will put you in a situation and let something die in you so that you can actually live. He's trying to kill the weed, not you. But God has not only planted you, but he has placed you in a way that serves him and it serves the purpose for which you were born. So that's why I say you were planted for purpose. You were planted for purpose. Your purpose was planned divinely by God. The city that you grew up in, where you move, where you work, where you live, all of that is strategic by God. And you, you have something for the place that he places you. But you know, there's something that is called companion planting, and it's a great way to be able to use space e efficiently uh, in a garden, particularly that brings mutual benefits uh, to it. And here's what I want you to see here, that uh, there, there's one example is called uh, the, the Three Sisters Companion Planting Model uh, that integrates corn and squash and beans. They each provide something to the other. The corn provides a stalk for the beans to be able to climb, and it becomes the visual deterrent for squash insects like the squash vine borer. And then the beans provide nit nitrogen, which is necessary in the soil. And then the squash can be a deterrent to vertebrae animals like raccoons, which often eat the sweet corn. There are different kinds of crops that God will put as companion planting so he doesn't just plant you. When I planted Word of Faith, it wasn't just me being planted, but God planted a wife in my life that became my counterbalance. And she had gifts uh, that were complementary to me as a companion. So things that I lacked at in, she had a strength in. That's companion planting. Do you know that there are some natural things that you can plant in your garden that will serve as an, as an herbicide, that will help repel insects like mosquitoes, lavender, different things, and lemongrass. They, these are certain things that can actually repel pests from your garden. Keep fleas off of you and, and, uh, and uh, irritating mosquitoes. You, you ought to have companions that God plants in your life that become your protector. Hey, 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 don't come over here. And it's like so-and-so scared to call you because your husband is home. And they won't come to your house because your wife is there. That's your protector. They're designed to repel people that don't mean you any good. You better thank God for companion planting. God will plant the right one that will help you to be better. They are a protector for you. They are protector. What, 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 you, excuse me. Is that something that I can help you with? Who, why are you calling? And I like the old kind of telephone that was where you had a cord. And you couldn't get around them by calling somebody's line direct. You had to, somebody's mom and daddy picked it up and they, they let you know that this is my phone. And you couldn't call after a certain time. And if you did, there were consequences that you, excuse me, young man, you know what time it is? You didn't call anybody's house after nine o'clock, you know? Trying to, you know, and talking your way to, to, until they fall asleep. See, that's companion planting. They're not there to spoil your fun, they're there to protect. And sometimes the devil can make you think that the very person who's assigned as a complimentary person to you that helps to supply something that you lack, they are a blessing actually that helps to protect you and they supply certain parts of your life that you don't necessarily have. Like you can have a real quiet, very reserved, laid back kind of personality. You go out to eat, you order a chicken dinner and the chicken comes back, you cut into it and it's bleeding. And they're like, oh no, well, it's, it's, it's okay, I mean, I'll just eat the vegetable thing. You no, know, no, don't bother. And homeboy, excuse me, sir, can you throw this back on the grill? 
You need them. You need somebody that will speak up to say, excuse me, hey, we're paying just like anyone else and they're going to treat us with dignity and respect in this place. You need somebody that will open their mouth. That's your companion planting. That they, God has planted somebody else in your life. You're not all things to all people. That's why you need somebody, whether it is a spouse, whether it is a friend, whether it is a parent, whether it is a relative, a sister, a brother. It's just somebody that becomes your advocate. You need somebody that God has planted in your life and you realize this person is a gift of God to me because God planted them in my world. That's companion planting. But here's what Bishop Bronner says, that we as spiritual trees are planted in specific places to change and impact the spiritual and social landscape of the world in which we live. And that's what we are supposed to do. We're called to change the spiritual atmosphere and the social landscape. When you know God, it ought to start in your home. If you know God and you're a person of prayer, you ought to be able to create a prayer firewall to say, devil, not on my watch. Don't you come in here messing with my spouse, my son, and my daughter. We are here to serve Jesus Christ. And that thing ought to flow out into how your life is lived socially. It starts in the spirit, but it is manifested in a very natural way in the social world in which we live. And remember now again, that if you don't know your purpose, you will distract yourself with pleasure. And when you find people that stay high all the time, they are just distracted from their purpose. You're not trying to chill out, you're already chilled out. You're distracted from your purpose, from your purpose, from your Purpose, anything that robs your sobriety, your clarity of thought, the way I can give myself to purpose. You were born for purpose. You ought to get your high by doing what you are put in the earth to do. I'm here to tell you that when the Spirit of God rides upon me, I feel like I have, and I've never done any drugs. I don't know what it's like. I've never had any edibles. I've never, I've never inhaled. But I've been high in the realm of the spirit where the peace of God floods over my soul. I felt like I was floating. I felt the glory of God rushing in. I don't know about you, but I just never felt a need for any of that other stuff. The Holy Ghost can take you into a realm that you don't know whether you're awake or asleep, it feels like a dream when the glory of God, I've all, oh, I've, you're talking about companion planning when he planted the Holy Ghost to live on the inside of you, to think through you, to give you divine ideas, to tell you back up baby girl, back up baby boy, hey, I meant we've got the ultimate companion with us, God has planted a companion in your life to be able to supply you in the areas of your deficiencies. And so we have a need for that. And though there is purpose for everyone who's in the earth, not everybody sees their purpose. Because looking is not the same as seeing. Not every open eye sees and not every closed eye sleep. We look with our eyes but we see with our heart. We look with our eyes, but we see with our compassion. We see with our empathy toward other people. We see with our spiritual discernments because sometimes you can see a person who looks like they are strong on the outside, but when you look with your heart, you see somebody who's afraid, somebody who's depressed, somebody who's battling thoughts of suicide, somebody who's dealing with abuse that has happened in their life and they're too afraid to open up to someone. And I tell you this, whatever you've suffered with, if you've ever been abused, you know what that look is in their eyes without their ever opening their mouth to you. And you got to be able to have eyes to see because you can feel their pain. You can feel it with your spirit. You can feel it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The way you just realize. I mean, sometimes, you know, when when you've gotten grown, You may be off of your mama's uh, lap, off of her knees, but you'll never get off of her heart. 
And when you're connected to somebody's heart, when they look at you, they see more than what meets the eye. Because your lashes may be meticulously done and your, your hair may be slayed, you may have your face beat, but they can look through the veneer of all of that beauty and all of that glory and all of your external accoutrements and they can see somebody that is hurting and that needs somebody to talk to and who's suffering silently with depression and they say, baby, what's wrong? You can talk to me. That's what I'm talking about. Having eyes looking and seeing. Looking and seeing. You got to be able to see some things by the Spirit. You got to be able to discern when your child hasn't spoken to you about what's going on in their world. And you got to be able to be sensitive enough to see when they come in and they go to their room and they close their door. Subtle little shifts, subtle, subtle, the subtle siftings of Satan. We look with our eyes, but we see with something totally different. It's amazing. Take a look here at Matthew chapter 13, verse 10 through 13, the New Living Translation. Jesus' disciples came to him and asked him, they said, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? And Jesus said to them, you're permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teachings, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. This is why I use parables. He says, for they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. You know what that means. Jesus spoke in parables, so it was a code language to the people that had the same Holy Ghost that he had. And he says, if you are born of my spirit, you'll know what I'm talking about. But the other folks will be saying, what in the world is he talking about? It's like you are talking in a secret code. Because these are things that only the Holy Spirit could translate to you and let you know this is what that means. But other folks hearing it, they would hear but have lack understanding. They would see it, but they just think that there's something on the surface. So they had those little symbols of a fish, and the fish was a symbol that you were a Christian. It was in reference to the miracle of Jesus multiplying the fishes and the loaves. They didn't identify themselves by a cross. He hadn't been to the cross yet. They identified themselves by the fish. By the fish, it was a code to identify to another person. Hey, you're a Christian too? They could just have, they, they have the symbol of the fish. And it was that secret code. And the folks who had not been born, who had not accepted Jesus, said, what? What's that fish doing? They must like seafood. <laughs> they are lookers, but they are not seers. There's a reason that the prophets were called seers. Because not everybody whose eyes are open can see. And this is my prayer. I pray, oh God, Lord, may you grant my eyes to be able to see beyond the obvious, God, and see through the veneer and the facades of other people, oh Lord, so that I can see their real pain, see their shame, see their issues, see their insecurities, see their fears, see their deficiency. Open my eyes, God, that I might behold and see like you see. That's what discerners do. They are able to see things by the Spirit and speak from the Spirit to the Spirit. I want you to notice how Jesus connected our fruitfulness to being his true disciples. Because Jesus is like, if you're connected to me, if you're connected to me, it is impossible for your life to be fruitless. Because we don't produce the fruit if you are connected to the vine. It, the fruit goes through the branch and manifests itself on the branch without the branch having to do anything except remain attached to the vine. That's, all, that's our biggest responsibility. John chapter 15, notice verse 5 through 8. Jesus said, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Where does fruit grow? On the branches. But it grows on the branches because the branch is connected to the vine. So Jesus said, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, not just a tiny bit, much fruit. If you remain connected, you'll produce much fruit. 
For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is not by might nor by power. This is not by your intellect. It is not by your program that you have studied. You might do something, but he's saying, in other words, if, you, if, if I'm not in it, it'd be sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. If I'm not in it, you know, you can give all of your, 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 your sell all your goods and feed the poor and, and give your body to be burned. And he says, if I'm not in it, you're not doing anything but wasting your time. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And he said, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Some branches are gathered into the pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything that you want and it will be granted. And when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciple. And this brings great glory to my father. I want you to notice that, that he's saying here that if you stay connected to me and if my words are in you and you're in me, you can ask whatever it is that you want and it shall be granted. Now, this doesn't mean that if you know Jesus, you can ask him for any and everything because you have to interpret scripture in line with other scripture. In, uh, 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 in 1 John chapter 5, the Bible says, and we know that he hears us if we ask anything according to his will. So it's got to be according to God's will. You can't just name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. You got to ask something that is in the will of God, because some of you all, your supervisor would be dead. <laughs> some other people, some of your relatives would be dead if, if he gave you everything that you ask. But he, he will grant those prayers when we ask something that is according to the will of God. I want you to understand this. Faith is not designed to change God's will. Faith is designed to facilitate God's will. So you don't use faith to force God to do something that he had no plan on doing. Faith is the hand that we use to reach into the eternal realm and bring into the natural realm. And I know some people that are just waiting, saying, you know, God, please, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for my, my promotion. I'm, I'm waiting to be transplanted to, to a better area, to a better position. But you know, while you're waiting on God to transplant you to a nicer, a bigger house, a nicer car, better living situations, God's waiting on you to grow. Because one of the worst things that he could do is to take you from the ghetto into the penthouse without growing you to have a mindset. That's what happened when they were in Egypt and got in the promised land and they had the mindset of Egypt on the inside of them. So he doesn't want to move you until he has grown you. So if you really want God to move you, grow. There's one word, grow. If you want better for your life, grow. Grow, just grow, just grow. Because like a house plant, you do not transplant a house plant into a bigger environment until it outgrows the environment that it currently is in. So when you begin to discover that this thing is now pot bound because the root systems are now all jungle mangled together here in the bottom of this thing, it, it's, it's not growing anymore here. It's going as far as it can go in this little environment. So I've got to transplant. I can put it outside now, or at least I've got to put it in a bigger pot inside. But its growth demands a bigger environment. As a baby who is assigned to the womb begins there, and after it outgrows the mother's womb, by the time that that baby reaches about six or seven pounds, eight, nine, by the time it's 10. I mean, you, you get some other whoppers that, that will come out at 11 or 12, but growth demands a new environment. Growth demands a new environment. Growth demands a new environment. I don't care whether you get big and grow through eating too much or big and buff through working out too much. And these little, you know, slim fit stuff now, you can't get your thighs in it and your biceps and your triceps in these things because you have grown. Growth demands a bigger environment. Growth demands a bigger environment. 
I mean, my wife and I, we started off in a little three-bedroom condo. And I didn't move until my family grew. My family grew. I'm like, we, we all on top of each other. Growth demands a new environment. You want a new environment? Don't ask God for it. Grow! If you grow, you can go. If you grow, you can go. If you grow, you can go. Growth demands a new environment. Tell somebody, tell them, I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm growing. I'm growing. It's amazing. If you want to move to better, grow. If you want to grow, you must be pruned. Because it is pruning, it is cutting off that actually causes you to produce more. So if I need to become more productive in my studies or in my career, I need to cut, I need to prune some of my social media. I need to prune hanging out with folks that's not about anything, that, that's not challenging me. I, I have to prune it. It doesn't mean that I have to just cut you out of my life. It means I need to limit my time. I need to give a certain amount of time. I need to prune. It's a cutting back. When you prune something, you're not cutting it all the way off. You're cutting it back so that more growth can come. If I want to move, I need to grow. But if I want to grow, I must be pruned. That means there's something that I have to be willing to lose because you must give up in order to go up. And if you can't give up liking things down on this level, I mean, being able to go home and do whatever you want, but when you want to be your own boss, you're going to have to give up some of your free time because you're going to have to think about things that if you were just working for somebody else, you wouldn't be thinking about this while you're at home. But when you're the person who's the decision maker, while you're at home, you'll be like, well, I wonder what can I do with such and such, and I'm going to see if I can. And every time you go somewhere, you're looking and getting ideas about things. You can't really turn it off. And when you are that person, something will wake you up at 1.38 in the morning. It'll be, I mean, it'll, it'll be 2.45. And, it's not time for you to get up, but I'm telling you, you don't really understand when you have a dream. A dream is not what you see in your sleep. A dream is what keeps sleep from you. It's when I'm having a hard time sleeping because what's on the inside of me is kicking, it is growing, it's demanding a new environment. And when that baby gets to a certain level, it begins to put you in birthing pains. You go into full-blown labor. It is the way of this baby said, I will tear this house down. Let me out, ready or not, here I come. It's growth demands a new environment. Growth demands a new environment. Growth demands a new environment. When you grow, you can't go back into an abusive relationship. T. Harv Ecker said that it's simple arithmetic. He says if you, you can grow your income only to the degree or to the extent that you do. You can grow your income only to the extent that you do. You can grow your income only to the extent that you do. You have to be committed to growth. Here's the way that Bishop Bronner says it. You can only grow or become what you're willing to to do consistently. You can only become what you are willing to do consistently. It's not what you do sporadically that helps you to grow. It's what you do consistently that helps you to grow. Whether it's in your prayer life, whether it's in witnessing, whether it is in working out. You, you wonder why some people don't grow spiritually? Because they only eat spiritually on Sunday. Ooh. Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> and then you're emaciating all during the week. It's what you do consistently. It's tomorrow when you wake up to say, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. It's not when the worship team gets here and invites you in. It's what you do consistently. 
what you do consistently. And I'm just here to remind you that God will always make a way for his people. Look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 17 through 20. Notice, he says, when the poor and needy search for water and there is none and their tongues are parched from thirst, then I, the Lord, will answer them. God says, I will answer thirsty people. Anybody who's thirsty for me, he said, I will answer them. I, I, the God of Israel, will never abandon them. Notice what the extent that God said that he'll go to, verse 18. I will open up rivers for them on the high plateaus, and I will give them fountains of water in the valley, and I will fill the deserts with pools of water. God says, I will make some things happen in an environment that it wouldn't normally happen in. And he says, rivers fed by springs will flow across the parched ground and I will plant trees in the barren desert. God says, I'll plant you in a place where there are barely any people here and you'll wonder, Lord, why in the world did you bring me out into this deserted place? Why did you put me out in the boondocks? Why did you put me out in the country? Maybe he put you out there because the dirt was sheep out there and he was going to develop something that would cause people to beat a path to your door. Maybe if you can trust him. And he says, I am doing this I'm doing this so that all who see this miracle will understand what it means that it is the Lord who has done this, the Holy One of Israel who created it. That's why God says I'm doing it. And notice Jesus said it this way, blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. That's a promise. It's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament, it was concealed. In the New Testament, it is is revealed. God says, anybody who has a thirst for me, if you're thirsty for me, like the deer pants for the water after the water broke, so my soul, if you have a thirst for God, God says, I will come into your driest place. I will break into your depression. I will come into your tribulation. I will come in and invade your lonely spells. I'll come there where you got negative thoughts, having anxiety attacks. God says, I will come in the midst of your dry place and I will plant you like a cedar of Lebanon. I will cause you as a mighty oak to be able to prosper in an environment that is harsh and hostile to you. But God says, I will do this so that you will know that surely the Lord has done this thing. It's amazing what God can and will do when you trust him. And he'll do it in an environment that didn't appear to be conducive to it, but God will make it happen. Because you wonder, God, why did you send me to this little place? Why did you send me to this side of town? Lord, there's nothing over here. There's nothing over here yet. If you obey him and grow. 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 God can cause you to blossom in even the most harsh environments, but you'll plant it for purpose. A tree is not just there just for aesthetic beauty. It serves so many other purposes. It's there for air quality. The air is different when you're in a place that's flooded with trees. Trees, as you know, we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. The trees breathe in carbon dioxide and they release for us oxygen. It's a divine exchange. And so they, we give them what they need, they give us what we need. But they help our air quality. And uh, the trees, they create a habitat, shelter for animals. They create shelter for birds. They create shelter for insects and a place for them to procreate in the trees. That's where the birds build their nests. That's where the foxes go. They they will go to the trees. That's where the monkeys are. They go to the trees. It is a haven for animals, birds, and insects to feed them, to give a place for their, their procreation. The trees provide shade for us. Their canopy, they provide shade. They provide shelter. Most of our homes are made from trees. Shelter. They prevent soil erosion. You have trees, they help the soil from eroding away. And and, and this is one that I really love. Because my dad was one who went in the backyard every day and took a nude sun bath, but it's because we had trees. (laughs) They give you privacy and they they hide what you do in your backyard from your nosy neighbors. (laughs) So that Karen can't see what's going on in the backyard. (laughs) Trees. Give us privacy. 
and they create barriers of delineation that mark territory. Because on the other side of these trees is your property, but on this side is my property. And sometimes just the borders of trees, just a tree, it's there for purpose. It's a multifarious purpose. And don't let anybody ever reduce you down to just one thing. In the same way that the tree has many purposes, so do you. So do you. And the beautiful thing is that when you're planted in the right place, I love this, you can still produce fruit even when you're old. Psalm 92, notice this, verse 12 through 15. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree and they will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. Planted in the house of the Lord. Planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God and they will still bear fruit in old age. They will still bear fruit in old age. If you're in your fourth quarter, they will still bear fruit in their old age and they will stay fresh and green. They'll still come up with new ideas. They'll still be writing. They'll still be dreaming. They'll still be thinking about things. They'll still be doing. Look at Mother Dylan over here, almost 90 years old, still planted in the house of the Lord. Still fresh, still green. Look at the green. Look at the green. <laughs> Fresh and green, still dreaming, still believing, still has ideas, still producing fruit. Glory! Hallelujah! Glory, glory, glory! Don't tell me that God is not real. He's still moving and he, he, whatever you didn't finish in your young days, I'm telling you, God will extend and give you length of days and long life. Not where you're just drooling and don't even know who you are, but you'll be fresh and green, still traveling, still ideating, still believing, still coming up with new things, still praying, still praying, still praying, still trusting God, still praying deliverance, still laying on hands for healing, still, still teaching. Hallelujah to Jesus. And may I remind you of this, that trees, trees grow both downward and upward at the same time because a tree is both uh, gravitropic and phototropic. And gravitropic, it means that it grows away from light and towards gravity. That means it goes down. Trees, before they do anything else, they begin to take root. They are gravitropic. They, they grow away from the light and towards gravity. Phototropic is just the opposite. Phototropic means that it grows away from gravity and towards the light. So it's not one or the other, it's both and. At the same time, when you are a tree, you will begin to be gravitropic first and then you will be phototropic at the same time, growing up toward the light and away from gravity, but going towards gravity and away from the light. It's important to go towards gravity first so that you'll be grounded, so that you're not high-minded so that you're not arrogant and pompous and supercilious, so that you are grounded, so that when God blesses you, you keep your feet on the ground. Your roots go down first. That I am gravitropic. It is gravitropic that before I build something, I'm gravitropic to the degree that I have to work in the dark, in the wee hours of the night. Gravitropic before I am phototropic before you can even see what I've been working on, that I've been praying before you realize that I was praying, that I was working when nobody knew my name, and I was studying 
before anybody ever sent me an invitation to go anywhere, that I was gravitropic and then eventually became phototropic. But at the same time, I was still, as I'm growing up, I still stay connected, stay connected so that I keep my feet on the ground, growing down and up, down and up, down and up at the same time. Gravitropic and phototropic. That's who we are. It is the way of the cross we are called to go vertically up to God and then horizontally out to people. We go up to God, that we get something from God and then we deliver it out to people. I don't have the authority to speak for God until I have spoken to God and God has spoken to me. If he doesn't speak to me, I don't have anything to say. If he doesn't give me divine revelation, I'm a sounding brass or a tickling cymbal. We got to go up before we go out. But you go down before you come up. God's kingdom is an opposite kingdom. The way up is down first. It's gravitropic. God wants to get you grounded first. God wants to get you grounded first before he takes you up and puts you into a heavenly experience. It's amazing. But until you establish your root system, It is your root system that makes your fruit system possible. I want you to take a look at the shard over in London, England. We got a few folks here from London. Where are you? London, England. We got London up here in the choir. You see this place there that's called the shard? It, it's an iconic location in London. It has 11,000 glass panels. 120 drilled piles going down 174 feet into the ground. It was secured, as you see it towering over, over London there, it was secured by 700 truckloads of concrete. And you don't see the concrete, the stuff that grounds the facility. Before the shards could be built up, it first had to be built down. Before the shard could be built up, it first had to be built down. The building's hidden roots hold the secret to its stability. It's called the shard. The next time you're in London, check it out. But it's not that that's above the ground that enables it to stand. It is a gravitropic work that has been done under the ground that nobody could see. It's amazing what God will do. And I want to say to you that we have mastered surviving, but now it's time to thrive and time to live. Amen. We are living in some prophetic times now, and I'm telling you, the hand of God is about to be revealed in the earth in ways. I've seen some things coming on the earth prophetically. You get ready to see that God's going, he's going to show you some stuff that you've not seen in your lifetime. You watch the hand of God that's of things that will happen in the earth that science cannot explain. You watch what God will do. You watch, keep your eyes open. I want you to not just be lookers, but I want you to be seers. I want you to understand prophetically that God's about to turn some things because he sits on the circle of the earth. And there's a hand of God that is about to be moving in various places. You just watch the hand of God. It's not gonna be long from now. I'm not talking about something theoretically that you may think that's gonna be many years off. This thing is nigh upon us. As a spiritual person, I know the urgency of the spirit when God is moving. I've seen the angels at the four corners of the earth. They've got something that they're about to unleash. I'm telling you, they were holding the reins. And they're just waiting on a word from God. And I'm just here to declare to you that there are some things that we have got to get right. Because the earth, we've lost our minds. And God's about to snap us back. Push it, pick it, us. I'm telling you divinely by the Holy Ghost. God is not unaware. You better know that there's one who sits there and he knows and God will do nothing in the earth except he reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophets. You better get ready. You better set your house in order. You better set your house in order. You better set your house in order because God's up to something. God's up to something. I want to say this to you. 
You don't necessarily have to focus right now on even breaking generational curses. You have to start focusing on generational blessings. To say, Lord, I want you to bless what's coming after me despite what has happened before me. If you focus on the generational blessings, it was Abraham that came out of paganism that never wasted his time in breaking a generational curse, but he received the blessing of God that is greater than the curse. It is the blessing that undoes the curse. When you focus on generational blessings. Nito Cobain said this, that your present circumstances don't determine where you can go. They merely determine where you start. Your current circumstances, they don't determine where you can go. They merely determine where you start. Here's what I say. Start where you are, but start. Start something. Build something. Grow. Start something. Start where you are. Start with God. Start where you are. Use what you have and who you have and then do all that you can do and trust the Holy Ghost to help you. Start. Go. Grow. You want to be transplanted? Grow. You want to grow? Be pruned. God will bring you to some places. Here in Genesis chapter 2 when he was talking about these things in creation, God gave Adam a job, told him what to do. Tend the earth, till the soil. I'm giving you stewardship here. He told him what to do. But in Genesis 12, he spoke to Abraham about who he would become. What you do and what you become are two different things. This was not based. Your current circumstances don't tell you what you have the power to become. Because you can see people that have come from brokenness and poverty. God says that when you become gravitrophic and trust in me, and if you will bow in humility, God exalts the humble. He says, if you'll just go down, if you'll just bow down your will and, and, and do it my way this time, I'll raise it up and I'll undo, overdo and outdo everything the devil has tried to do in your life, in your family, that he's trying to work in your mind, in your body. He'll outdo it. He'll outdo it. And he's trying to bring us into a place now where we can have the Spirit of God to empower us to be able to build something that is a planting of the Lord and it produces fruit for his glory. And he's just looking for people that will say, Lord, use me. Use my family for your glory. For your glory. For your glory, God, to be able to build something that matters, that makes a difference, that I am planted on purpose. There's a reason that you're planted in the, in the place where you are with the problems. A problem is an opportunity for growth. When you need to grow, God will introduce problems into your world. Nothing will grow you like a problem. And sometimes you wonder why in the world am I having so many problems. It's the university of adversity. God is growing you. He's growing you. He is enlarging you. And one thing, when God begins to grow you, whatever hat you bound, the Bible says, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the fatness, the anointing. It's because you grow bigger and pow, because what was holding you has no power to grow, but you can. He's waiting on us to grow your planet and everything that is planted is designed to grow. Everything that is planted is designed to grow. And if you stop growing, it is only because you have become disconnected from the vine. Disconnected. And you will be beautiful for a season. And people cannot even tell that you've been disconnected. And that you haven't been praying and reading your Bible because you still look like you're flourishing for a season. For a season. And afterwards... If you stay disconnected too long, 
your leaves begin to wither. Your fruit falls to the ground because of your disconnectedness. But God will transform what was a graveyard into a garden. A graveyard is where things are buried. What's buried stays there, but what is planted comes back up. Jesus was planted. No wonder he spent the night in the garden of Gethsemane because he was a seed who fell to the ground to die so that many sons and daughters could be born. You are planted for purpose. Bow your heads. There are those of you who are here today You look better than you are. Your leaves are glossy. Your fruit is shiny. But you're dying on the inside. Because you're not attached to the life giver, to the vine. You have to abide in the vine. Remain attached to the vine, Jesus the Christ. Some of you started off there. You're on fire at one time, but you know that you're not where you need to be and where you used to be. And Jesus is saying, this is now a time for you to be grafted in and reattached so that that life can flow back to you. We had a man in one of our facilities operating a circular saw and cut off several of his fingers by accident that had to be dug out of the saw. We immediately put those detached phalanges on ice and sent them to the hospital with the man so that they could be reattached. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that if you've had a detachment from the vine, he's a neurosurgeon. And he knows how to reattach every nerve ending, every capillary, every vessel back to where it can move once again. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you know that you've been cut off, you're not what you need to be with Jesus, but you want to change that today, I want you to just meet me here at the altar. Just meet me. Just meet me. Just get up out of your seat and come on down while the other heads are bowed. But if you realize, Lord, I can't keep on going this way. I know better. I wasn't raised this way. I know I've gotten off track. I'm missing something, God, of a place that I used to be with you. This is not who I am. And my condition right now does not prophesy where I'm able to go. It only prophesies where I start. And today, Lord Jesus, I, begin, I determined that I will start with you. I will start with you. I will start with you. Come on. Come on back home. Come on and get yourself rooted and grounded. Come on. Come on so that life begin to flow back through you. You are creative. You are gifted. You are blessed. Your mind is intelligent. You got more ideas than what you know what to do with. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let him get plugged back in. Come on. Get reattached to the vine. Reattached to the vine. Reattached to the vine. Come. Come. Come ye to the waters without money and without price. Jesus loves you. He loves you. You belong to him. You were planted on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. There's a reason that you're here today and that you heard what you heard today. It's your day. He's drawing you by his own spirit right now, even now, even now, even now he's drawing. Saying, come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're worn out. This thing has sucked the life out of you. You get up some mornings and you don't even want to get out of the bed. You've got a darkness and a heaviness on you. You don't even understand how to explain. Sometimes you just break out crying and you don't even understand what's wrong with you. You feel this darkness. You feel this heaviness. Come on and get it out because you can, so you can be reattached to the vine. Today is your day. Today is your day. He's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you. Come, 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 come. Come, come. Intercessors ought to be interceding right now. Somebody's having the battle of their life. 
where they're saying, get up out of your seat and go and step out and, and bust a move, get uncomfortable, grow. All growth happens outside of the comfort zone. All growth happens outside of the comfort zone. Come, 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 bust a move. Thank you, Jesus. 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 God is good. He's patient. He's waited for you. He's waited for you. He's waited for you. He's waited for you. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.